The nine o'clock news first on BBC One with Michael Burke. There's been widespread violence in Northern Ireland after the release of the paratrooper Private Lee Clegg. Scores of vehicles have been hijacked and burnt in nationalist areas of the province. John Major's back in Downing Street tonight after a last appeal to his MPs to let him stay there. And the train drivers plan a summer of strikes on the railways. Good evening. The Northern Ireland peace process is facing its toughest test so far tonight as street violence erupted across the province in protest at the release of Private Lee Clegg. More than 100 vehicles have been hijacked, looted and burnt in demonstrations that have not been seen in Ulster since long before last year's paramilitary ceasefires. Private Clegg was released at dawn this morning after four years in jail. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for murdering Karen Riley, a teenage passenger in a stolen car that drove through his patrol in Belfast. Lee Clegg posed for photographs this morning at Catterick Garrison, a few hours after he'd walked out of his prison cell. Despite shouted questions from reporters, Private Clegg was sticking to orders and keeping quiet. Whether it was the sensitivity of the occasion or simply military preference for good order, the photo call was tightly organised. Don't cross the barriers and go into the grassed area and start mobbing the bloke or your invitation to the camp will be receded there and then. The only direct words from Lee Clegg were in a short written statement in which he said he was delighted to be out of jail. He was freed from his life sentence in Wakefield Prison by authorisation of the Northern Ireland Secretary, who has the power to do so if convinced that someone has served sufficient time and isn't a threat to the public. More of Private Clegg's reaction to that decision came from his legal adviser. He has told me today that he does not see his release as any kind of victory and that his thoughts are again with Karen Riley's family at what must be a very difficult time for them. He would also like to thank all those in the press whose coverage of the case represented the public's mammoth support for him. Private Clegg was a member of an army patrol which fired on a stolen car in West Belfast. The court accepted that Lee Clegg fired three times in self-defence, but the fourth shot came after the car had passed him and could no longer have been a threat. That bullet killed 17-year-old Karen Riley in a case which has always been as controversial as it was tragic. There were allegations the soldiers faked injury to make it look as though the car hit them. In the parachute regiment's barracks outside Belfast, a large mock-up of the car was made and put in the canteen. The unsavoury caption next to it was an indication of the mutual suspicion between the parachute regiment and elements in the nationalist community in Northern Ireland. Lee Clegg's conviction for murder was upheld after two appeals, but the campaign to free him then began in earnest. A petition to Downing Street and a steady stream of stories in the national press, insisting he was a victim of miscarriage of justice. There were influential voices behind the scenes, trying to persuade the authorities that today's outcome was the right one. For many serving and former military personnel, the Clegg case struck a chord. I think for a large number of men who are still in the services now and those who have service experience, real service experience, could look at the case and say, there but for the grace of God won't I. And Clegg was a victim of the most horrendous circumstances and uh, in a split second decision, decision firing that fourth shot led into a life sentence and a conviction of murder. Now that is serious, there's something very wrong there. Views shared by another member of Lee Clegg's patrol on that night nearly five years ago. We thought uh, everyone would realise that we were doing a job, that we were looking after ourselves, that the whole incident was really self-defence. Um, I myself never thought that it would go this far. When we first found out that the, uh, they were going to be arrested, it was just everyone was in shock, the whole battalion. Lee Clegg remains convicted of murder but he's hoping his release on licence will soon be followed by the quashing of his conviction. Neil Bennett, BBC News. Sinn Féin has denied claims that it orchestrated today's violence in Belfast, but it said Private Clegg's release was a clear case of one law for him and another for Republican prisoners. Downing Street said allegations that the release was connected with the Conservative leadership election were utter rubbish and said there should be no damage to the peace process. 
the Falls Road in West Belfast this afternoon, and passions that have been in abeyance since the IRA ceasefire once again inflamed. With the peace process on hold and the release of prisoners one of the core issues, the freeing of a British soldier convicted of murder has brought back street disturbance reminiscent of the 1970s. Angry crowds were back on the street too, angry that they see one law for soldiers and another for everyone else, their worst suspicions about the government's intentions confirmed. The father of Karen Riley said he felt he was in a dark tunnel and that today justice had been undone. They changed the rules to suit themselves and I don't understand how, how, how they were able to done, but I don't call that justice, no. The actual justice in him being put in, in prison for life, we were totally happy with and we have no complaints with whatsoever, but it's what's happened since. Trouble in places like Londonderry too is what's happened since Sir Patrick Mayhew's decision. For Republicans, it's insult to indecision in other areas of the peace process. We're now almost one year into uh, the IRA cessation and the British government have shown no inclination whatsoever to initiate all party peace negotiations. This decision to uh, release uh, Lee Clegg I think exacerbates all of that and there's no doubt about it that we have a, a fairly tense situation at the moment. In loyalist areas, the unmistakable message, they also want their prisoners out. But here there are mixed feelings. In a sense, they're happy that he has been released, but at the same time, they're a wee bit angry that we have prisoners in prison serving in excess of 18 years for similar offences, and they haven't been given the same consideration that he has been given. And the Irish government is convinced that the whole prisoner issue does come into play. I think it is important that uh, the law would be seen uh, to be implemented in a fair manner right across the board. And I think the prisoners, many of them, would be very concerned at the implications of this case, as opposed to the treatment that they have been receiving for many, many years. It was a junior minister at a public engagement who spoke for the government. For it, there are no ramifications from the release. It has little bearing on the peace process. We want politicians of all parties to get involved in substantial talks. Uh, and this particular case should be viewed as a one-off but judged on the merits of the individual case and not as any political decision. There's no hope of that putting out the flames. It may be a one-day outpouring of anger, maybe a real crisis to threaten the peace. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Belfast. In the last few hours before the Conservative leadership contest, both candidates have been trying to win over the wavering MPs whose votes are crucial. Both John Major and John Redwood have said only a victory for them will save the party from disaster in a general election. This evening, both men have addressed the Backbench 92 group, an influential body of about 80 centre-right Tory MPs who favour more open markets and want the government to take a more sceptical line on Europe. John Major left the Commons tonight knowing the following arithmetic for certain, that all 18 MEPs are behind him, over 90% of the constituency associations are with him and that 95% of peers are giving their support. But seeing as none of these has a vote, his camp is still left with the highly ambiguous sums based on the declared intentions of Tory MPs. Around Westminster and on the Commons Terrace, there was much chewing over the Prime Minister's performance at the 92 Group this evening. John Major offered no concessions on either the single currency or a referendum and dismissed suggestions that he'd be giving MPs a free vote on contentious European issues in future. If anybody was wavering, I think he would have found the Prime Minister's performance very, um, very admirable indeed and very persuasive. I'm supporting the Prime Minister to give him one more chance, but I'm not with an over-happy heart, no. But the Redwood camp, Mr Redwood, also appeared at the 92 group this evening, say their man was the winner. Well, I understand that one or two colleagues who, were at, at, who had, did actually attend the meeting are saying that they are now um, going to support John Redwood tomorrow as a result of his performance tonight, so um, it could well have an effect. For the number crunchers, it's the irritating number of waverers like David Shaw that still make this contest impossible to forecast accurately. Each candidate has strengths. John Major, it's clearly the strength of his track record that I'll be looking at. In the case of John Redwood, it's the strength of some of his policy positions, in particular the offer of a single currency referendum, which is very attractive to many of my constituents. There has been um, a certain amount of uh, minor intimidation and also uh, I wouldn't say a bribe, but an implied suggestion that I'm, I might do well if I vote in a particular way.
For public consumption, neither camp will talk about such tactics or inducements, but the Redwood team do offer one incentive. They say if you want a second round with a wider choice of candidates, then he's the only show in town. I say to all Conservative parliamentary colleagues, consider well your vote. If you think we need a change to win, then vote for one. And there is only one way to vote for change in this election, that is to vote for me. And that's a thinly coded appeal to supporters of Michael Heseltine, who continues to sweep aside suggestions that he's preening himself just in case. A John Major triumph continues to be his prediction and that of the other Michael, Michael Portillo. There had been fears in the major camp that the Prime Minister was going to be ambushed when he appeared before the 92 group this evening, with leading members emerging only to declare that after reflection they were backing John Redwood. They haven't, or at least they haven't yet. This campaign has ended in a rather less frenzied manner than it began, even if the debate over what constitutes a real victory for John Major hasn't been resolved. John Sopel, BBC News, Westminster. The Prime Minister has made it clear that he expects a convincing victory in the vote tomorrow. A short while ago, our political editor Robin Oakley spoke to Mr Major in Downing Street. The Prime Minister was in cheerful enough mood after his meeting with the 92 group, though he won't have been pleased to learn that since John Townend, one leading right-winger, has declared for John Redwood. Mr Major wasn't keen to talk numbers, but I suggested to him he needed much more than a technical victory. A technical victory doesn't exist. It's going to be much better than that. I'm not going to speculate on figures, but it will be clear-cut and decisive. But you've asked for a vote of confidence. Doesn't it have to be by a very significant margin? Well, I think you must wait for the result tomorrow. I think the uh, result will be clear-cut. I'm not going to speculate beyond that. Is there a danger that by conducting this exercise you've institutionalised the split in the party? No, I think quite the reverse. I think I've exorcised it. Once, uh, once this is uh, concluded, this leadership exercise, there will then be no doubt about the leadership of the Conservative Party. Clearly, the Conservative Party is a very difficult one to lead these days, but do you think you've been perhaps too much of a conciliator and not enough of a leader? I don't think you can uh, lead uh, any great political party from the fringes of policy and thought. You have to lead a party broadly from the centre, the Conservative Party ideally from the centre-right, which is where I believe I stand. I want a very broad-based party. I do not want a factionalised party that produces huge enthusiasm amongst a minority of people and is viewed with distaste by other people. You say you're not going to change, not even in style, not even in the mo way you discipline the party? Because it is a pretty undisciplined rabble at the moment, isn't well, it? I th well, your word's not mine. I'm not subscribing to that description. But I think the Conservative Party will come together, and I think the uh, peer pressure of members of Parliament will make it clear that that is their expectation. And if I may add the point, I think the position of the party in the country ought not to be overlooked. They have made it clear beyond a shadow of doubt that they are fed up to the back teeth with what has been going on, and they have equally made it clear in huge numbers that they support the policies that I have been following and my continuation as leader of the Conservative Party. Now that is a different backcloth from the speculation of a few days ago. We'll have the speculation behind us and the reality of party opinion right in front of us. Mr Major's message to his divided party was clear enough. Don't expect me to change my style or my policies. But if you don't get together after this leadership election, the party and the country will never forgive you. Michael. Robin, Mr Major keeps talking about winning a clear-cut and decisive victory. What do you think he will regard as clear-cut and decisive? Well, he's certainly not putting any public figure on that. I suggest the kind of figure he has in mind is about 200 MPs backing him, because that's the same proportion, uh, around 60%, that Tony Blair got when he won Labour's leadership election. A lot of people in the Conservative Party would say Mr Major would need rather more than that, something around 220, 230 votes to move into the comfort zone. But what I gather from one senior Cabinet colleague is that the Prime Minister is likely to fight on even if he is in that sort of grey area. He thought that uh, a week ago Mr Major might have stepped down if he didn't get a really convincing victory from this election. Now he believes he's crystallised his thoughts and is determined to fight on. But what's the talk at Westminster, Robin? What actually will be good enough to ensure his survival, let alone reassert his authority, which is what he wants? 
every MP you talk to has a different figure. What a lot of them are saying now is, well, I don't know exactly what the real figure of a safety margin is, but I'll know it when I see it. I think what a lot will depend on the discussions that uh, follow immediately after the leadership election result comes out among the 1922 executive, among Mr Major's cabinet colleagues. But at the end of the day, I think the most important thing of all will be the Prime Minister's will, whether he chooses to carry on or not. Robin, thanks very much. And you can see the result of the election live on BBC One tomorrow afternoon when David Dimbleby presents a leadership election special live from Westminster. That's at five o'clock tomorrow afternoon on BBC One. Rail passengers face a series of one-day rail strikes this summer after the train drivers union ASLEF voted to take industrial action in support of a 6% pay claim. The union has called six 24-hour strikes to take place on July the 11th, 18th and 27th, August the 8th and 25th and September the 12th. British Rail has asked the drivers to reconsider. The train drivers claim the 60% vote for a strike shows their determination to win an increase above 3%. As left says it's not prepared to take an effective pay cut when British Rail's making a hefty profit. The ASLEF leader accused the government of imposing a pay policy on the industry on the eve of privatisation. His members aren't hotheads, but they're not having it. We don't want this form of industrial action to take place at all, but we want a reasonable management. You want to go and talk to the British Railways Board, talk to the government and ask them why they're creating a the havoc that there is in this railway industry of ours. It's not the union's fault. British Rail condemned the disruption, saying it's easier to get into a strike than out of one. It's still not too late for more talks, though the management insists it's made its final offer. 3% is a better offer than other pu public sector workers have been given. You'll recall the nurses are struggling to get 3%, and I'm offering 3%, no strings attached. Last summer, signal workers in another rail union, the RMT, staged strikes for more than three months. If RMT members on BR and the London Underground vote later this week to join with ASLEF, the strikes will bite harder, a prospect which dismayed these travellers tonight. People understand one or maybe two, but when it goes on for week after week after week, then I think they should find another way. It does always seem to be the, the railway men that get on the strike and nobody else does, but maybe that's just because they've got the guts to do it. The train drivers have a tradition of sticking by their union, and they're the one group on the railways capable of bringing services to a halt. So unless British Rail up their offer, passengers face a long, hot summer. John Fryer, BBC News, at ASLEF headquarters. Health service workers are to be balloted on industrial action after talks to resolve their four-month-old pay dispute broke down. Unions representing 600,000 health workers rejected the government's national pay offer of 1% with up to 2% negotiable at local level. The parents of a teenager who died in the Marchioness pleasure boat disaster six years ago have been awarded almost £34,000 in damages. But Vincenzo and Eileen Delalio say the money will almost certainly be taken up by legal costs. Their daughter, Francesca, was among 51 people who died when the Marchioness was hit by the dredger Beau Bell. Eileen Delalio, here on the left, has seen her five-year campaign for damages end with a High Court ruling that she says is morally wrong. She had been offered £50,000 out of court but chose to fight on. Today's award is lower, which means she has to pay costs, so in effect, ending up with nothing. They have applied for their costs and they have been granted their costs. So I went in with nothing and I come out with nothing. Her daughter Francesca, who was 19, died when the dredger Beau Bell collided with the Marchioness Pleasure Cruiser on the River Thames in August 1989. She was a promising ballerina who'd signed contracts to dance and teach ballet just before her death. Because her parents both have disabilities, the Delalios argued that Francesca would have contributed significantly to family finances had she lived. Therefore, damages for her death should be substantial. However, under English law, punitive damages are not awarded in such cases, only settlements covering loss of earnings. Film stars in libel actions who've suffered a paragraph of abuse in the tabloids about something quite trivial receive very large sums in punitive damages whereas parents of children who die in these sort of circumstances get so very little money. The Law Commission is looking at how damages are calculated by the courts in cases like this. But ultimately it's for Parliament to decide. 
Meanwhile, Eileen Delalio says she's considering whether or not to appeal against today's ruling. Clive Myrie, BBC News at the High Court. Israel has made an offer to the PLO to withdraw troops from most Arab villages and six towns in the West Bank. But Israel's Foreign Minister Shimon Peres said they'd maintain a military presence in villages along the Israeli border. The offer could break the deadlock between the two sides when negotiations restart tomorrow. Ferry services to the Greek islands are returning to normal following the end of a strike by seamen. Daily departures have been doubled to meet the backlog of tourists and freight services. Thousands of holidaymakers were stranded during the four-day dispute over pay and working conditions. Russian and American astronauts have spent the final day of the first space link-up in 20 years, completing a program of medical experiments. Two astronauts will remain aboard the Mir space station after the US shuttle Atlantis unhitches tomorrow. The England cricketers Devon Malcolm and Philip de Freitas are threatening legal action over a magazine article that says players born in the West Indies are not as committed to England as those born here. Both players are named in the article in Wisden Cricket Monthly. Some of the finest players in English county cricket are black, some born here, some abroad. Many are outraged at the suggestion they may not be as committed to the national team as their white colleagues. The issue is raised in Wisden Cricket Monthly by a contributor who's called elsewhere in the past for tougher action on immigration. Here he writes, whatever his professional pride as a cricketer, it's difficult to believe that a foreign-born player has any sense of wanting to play above himself simply because he's playing for England. I'm very angry because I just feel that um, the article really is saying that we still feel that black players out there or black people in general are not a part of British society and that we actually get great delight in seeing England lose, which is rubbish. I mean, as a child, I've, I've always imitated when I was playing cricket in the garden, I've always imitated um, English players. All I ever wanted to do was play for England once. Black players have produced some astonishing performances for the England team. Last August, the pace bowler Devon Malcolm made headlines by taking nine test wickets in an innings against South Africa. He's one of three black cricketers who play for Derbyshire. The club wants the Cricketers Association, the Players' Union, to take legal action. When you consider the amount of effort they've put into playing for England over a number of years and the success they've had doing it, to be told in writing that uh, they may not necessarily be trying is uh, naturally very upsetting for them. The editor of the magazine says no harm was intended. He denies it's racist, arguing it's part of a legitimate debate. I simply see it as an area of sport, sport psychology, which is also a boom industry these days, where um, it's worth a look. But that's not enough for black players who've been singled out over white cricketers born abroad. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News. The chief executive of South West Water has been given a 45% pay rise. Bill Fraser's salary will now be just under £220,000, one of the highest salaries in the water industry. Water bills in the South West are the highest in the country. Leslie Rowe and her four children were without water for 24 hours during last week's heatwave because South West Water couldn't cope with increased demand. Today she's flabbergasted at news that the company's boss has been awarded a huge salary increase. Absolutely furious because if there are problems with the system, if the system is under stress, then some of that money should be going into improving the system so that this doesn't happen. The increase takes the annual pay package of Chief Executive Bill Fraser to nearly £220,000. Since being privatised in 1989, South West water bills have more than doubled. They're now the highest in the country. In protest, customers publicly burned their bills at last year's annual general meeting. I wonder what Bill Fraser would think if he was in the same position as them at having to pay 10% of his income in water charges that in fact would mean he'd have a bill of at least £22,000 based on his salary alone. South West Water says directors' pensions are part of a remuneration package designed to attract high-calibre executives who have significant experience of running major PLC companies. Mr Fraser is not the most expensive. That's Sir Desmond Pitcher of North West Water, who's paid over £300,000. 
but the days of big payouts could be numbered. Customers hope the CBI report on executive pay due out this month will recommend that privatised utilities limit their directors' salaries. Christine Stewart, BBC News. The American tennis player Jeff Tarango, who accused an umpire of corruption during his Wimbledon singles match on Saturday, has been fined a total of £10,000. The record fine was for shouting at the crowd, abusing the umpire and failing to complete a match. In today's games, Britain's Jeff number Tarango one... Jeff returned to Wimbledon in the mid-afternoon to collect his prize money. He looked and spoke know, I mean, like a broken man. And I can be suspended for life and... and all this other stuff people are saying, $100,000 fine, this is, this is uh, terrible, outrageous stuff for me just standing up for what I believe in. And, you know. Yet, strangely, this was some four hours after the All England Club had announced something a good deal less severe, a $15,500 fine, that's about £10,000. Tarango says he'll appeal against the sanction, which was for three separate offences. $500 for this. Oh, shut up! <laughs> 10,000 for this. You are the most corrupt official in the game and you can't do that. And another 5,000 for walking off court. Court violation, verbal abuse, point penalty, no Mr. Way. Tarango. That's it! In every way, therefore, Tarango has surpassed John McEnroe, whose $10,000 fine four years ago was the previous highest, and who, along with Pete Sampras and Mats Villander, was described as supportive as Tarango welcomed further inquiries into his allegations. All the evidence of the case will be brought to the Grand Slam committee's attention. So far, I feel the investigation is going on and hopefully will continue to be conducted as fairly as it has been so far. And after that, he left. His wife, Benedict, accused in today's report not only of slapping the umpire, but also of pinching and twisting his arm, was also praised in her husband's statement. Together, he said, they'd had to face overwhelming pressures. Umpire Ruba, meanwhile, was comfortable enough, it seemed, perched above the new British number one, Greg Rosetsky, as his day of reckoning finally arrived in the form of Wimbledon champion Pete Sampras. But in an afternoon when the spectacular action has largely been off court, Sampras, like all the other top seeds today, was too good for his opponent. He clinched the match, ironically, as Rosetsky's most potent weapon, his serve, let him down with a double fault. British interest in the singles is therefore at an end. Rob Bonnet, BBC News at Wimbledon. That's it. Newsnight is over on BBC Two at 10.45, but from the 9 o'clock news, good night. Good evening from Newsroom South East. An armed hold-up at an Essex jeweller's ended in tragedy this afternoon when a man who worked there was shot dead. Two raiders are thought to have fled empty-handed. A woman member of staff was injured as she ran from the store and was hit by a car. Two robbers burst into Sparkler's jewellery store on Billericay High Street just after 3 o'clock. They threatened the staff with a sawn-off shotgun and ordered them into a back room. It all went wrong when a customer walked into the store and a member of staff tackled one of the gunmen. After a short struggle, he was shot dead. As the robbers fled, a female member of staff ran out into the street to try and find help and was struck by a passing car. She was slightly hurt. I heard a gunshot and I did see somebody running away from the area towards stock, um, carrying um, a black bag under his arm. The robbers were later seen getting into a distinctive car in a nearby car park. Which is this bright red American car. Um, when you think of these descriptions, there's nearly a foot difference in height between these two men. Somebody must know who they are. Police are anxious to hear from anyone who may have seen the robbers, who are described as middle-aged. One was about six foot tall and of slim build. The other just over five feet with a receding hairline. Police in Essex are preparing to crack down on young drivers who gather for Saturday night hot rodding sessions in a car park. Scores of extra officers will be on duty this weekend. The drivers congregate at the Lakeside Retail Park in Thurrock. The police say someone could soon be killed. It's loud and the police say extremely dangerous. One Saturday in every month, gangs of youths turn shopping centre car parks in Thurrock into their personal racetracks. The events are highly organised and thousands of people come to watch the action.
but there are no crash barriers to protect the spectators. Last month, the car burst its tyre and came within inches of the crowd. When they're doing the moving manoeuvres with the handbrake turns, the skidding, the putting on the brakes and so on, um, uh, I would strongly suggest that inexperienced drivers don't know how to do that and could easily go into the crowd. Police have made previous attempts to stop the event, but last time they tried, the officers involved were besieged by an angry crowd and forced to retreat. This time they say they mean business, and 180 officers will be on standby in the Thurrock area this weekend. Storekeepers are supporting police action. Many have put up barriers and employed their own security guards. We want to put the safety of our customers first. Uh, we're concerned that somebody may well be injured, and so obviously we'd like to back the police and actually get them stopped. The police message is simple. If the mystery organisers don't come forward to discuss staging an event that is safer, then there won't be one at all. Those are the main stories in the southeast this evening. We'll back, be back tomorrow in business breakfast, but now the weather with Penny Tranter. Good evening. What a difference a month makes. At the end of June in the heat wave, we saw temperatures in Bristol, 31 degrees. But at the beginning of July, much cooler. Temperatures 10 degrees down on that, just 21 degrees during today. And for the rest of the week, it's going to be cooler and cloudier. And we can see that tomorrow as this frontal system moves in from the north, bringing a good deal of cloud and also some occasional light rain and drizzle. Already a good deal of cloud right across the country. Thick enough to give us one or two showers this evening in the southeast and some patchy rain in the far north of Scotland. And and that rain in the far north will gather and move over many parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland by dawn tomorrow with temperatures around 8 to 10 degrees. Elsewhere in England and Wales it's going to be a mainly dry night and quite warm along the south coast, temperatures around 12 degrees. Tomorrow morning for much of England and Wales it's going to be dry and bright with some sunny intervals here and there. But a different story in Northern Ireland and much of Scotland where it will be cloudier and damper with the odd spot of light rain and drizzle. As we go into the afternoon, turning brighter in many parts of Scotland, perhaps with the odd shower around, while that cloudier weather moves into northern England and northern Wales. But for southern and central England, it looks as though it's going to remain dry and bright, with still a little bit of sunshine around. And it's going to be a little warmer in the south tomorrow, temperatures nudging 21 degrees in the London area, but in the cloudier areas further north, temperatures closer to 16 to 18 degrees. But better news for hay fever sufferers, as pollen counts are going to be low to medium. And also good news for Wimbledon tomorrow. It's going to be fine and dry, temperatures close to 21 degrees. But then on Wednesday, it's all change as this vigorous area of low pressure steaming in from the Atlantic will bring a good deal of cloud and also rain. That rain getting into many western areas during the morning and then getting into many other eastern areas, extreme, except for the extreme southeast by the end of the afternoon, with brighter showery weather coming into the northwest later on in the day. And then on Thursday, that'll clear away into the North Sea with many areas seeing brighter weather, particularly in the afternoon. That's it. Good evening.